Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hello, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest show anywhere online today. We appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube to help raise your health IQ. And really today's show is all about giving you a pick me up for your health. Check this out. A recent study found that nearly half of us start to feel drowsy by noon. And what does that mean? It means, well, if you don't choose your midday meal carefully, you could wind up with a serious food coma before you call it a day. So how can we go about avoiding those afternoon downtime, right? Now, whatever it is that you want to call it, what are the top foods for energy? That is what we will be exploring on the show today with dietitian extraordinaire, the fiber queen, Lee Crosby is here with us to answer that question. And she's probably going to tell us also the foods that can actually help maybe drain the energy. What are the kinds of foods that we want to avoid? to avoid that food coma. She's gonna tell us that as well. So today's show is really a big old pick me up. And because she's a dietitian, instead of opening the doctor's mailbag, we're gonna be opening the dietitian's mailbag here on the program today. Already have a lot of great questions coming in. Questions like, what is the best way to beat a sugar addiction? That's one that a lot of us struggle with. And as you're looking for sugar alternatives, well, what about monk fruit sweetener? Is that a healthy option? We'll be finding that out as well. And can fiber help you lose weight? Well, she is the fiber queen after all. So we're going to get to the bottom of that as well. Comments or the chat, you can also tweet it to us or hit us up on Instagram using the hashtag exam room live. So let's go ahead and kick things off right now and find out what are the top foods for energy? Let's welcome Lee Crosby, the fiber queen to the exam room live. Lee, how you living? I am doing great, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing good. Do you fall into that category of nearly half of us? I think it was like 42% of Americans start to feel drowsy by noon. Do you fall into that category? Depends on the day, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on if my very sweet doggies kept me up in the middle of the night. Mm, uh, we just adopted a pair and they are all kinds of fun. But no, really, it is um, typically no, thankfully. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Now, I know that like sleep deprivation can play a huge role there, right? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. But yeah. I also know that food plays a very big role. So this person who watches us every week, they wrote in, they hit us up on Twitter, wanted to know, well, what are the foods that I should be eating? What are the top foods that can give us an energy boost? All right. Yeah. So again, you're not going to undo no sleep the night before. But in terms of things you can do to mitigate that, um, a couple of favorites. First, if you need a quick boost that is not going to then crash you later. I like fruit. So if you're just, I need a snack, I'm falling over. You know what? Have, have an orange, have some berries, have some grapes. So that's going to give you that little oomph with the blood sugar, but it's not going to send you up for that roller coaster ride where you're really energetic for 15 minutes. And then you're so much more tired because you crash. So, and that's the catch with things like the sugary treats and the sodas, they send you up and then they just break your heart and crash you down. So <laughs> yeah, we want to look for those things that also have fiber to give us a little bit of a slower burn. And speaking of slow burn at lunch itself, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for these complex carbs that are like extended release when it comes to like a nice, slow, steady rise and fall for your blood glucose. Um, so those are things like beans and whole grains. And then you're going to also want to give yourself a nice injection of antioxidants with some preferably dark leafy greens, because you guys know me, but any of those fruits and vegetables, particularly fresh fruits and veggies, that's anecdotal. I just think they're more refreshing and kind of a little bit of a pick me up. Mm, I'm a big fan of the of the fresh fruit. I mean, especially right now, right? So oh, like man. warmer weather, everything's yeah. coming into season. I'm driving yesterday and I'm starting to see signs for pick your own strawberries, you know? So that's pretty exciting stuff. Oh yeah. But let me ask you this. Conversely, if you go for the simple carbohydrates at lunch and say you go to McDonald's or something, right? You get the Big Mac meal. Oh. Is that the kind of food that's really going to drain your energy? What are the, the traps that you're looking for there as far as energy suckers that'll send you into that food coma? Okay. So food coma. Yeah. So certainly a Big Mac could do it. It's actually not going to be as much the, you know, refined flour in the bun, although that's not great. It's because a Big Mac is loaded with saturated fat and there's good data in terms of a single high fat meal can do some really rough things to your blood vessels that can make you sluggish. All right. For example, a meal high in saturated fat, like kind of fat that's predominantly found in animal products, it literally thickens your blood after you eat it. So it is just harder for your body to pump blood 
for your heart to pump blood all around the body. Well, why does that really matter? Because in terms of wakefulness and giving your brain what it needs to operate, you need blood moving freely up to your brain. So if you have thicker blood, that is going to make that more challenging. Um, the other piece is that it actually, that same single, just one high fat meal, one bad lunch choice can also cause your arteries to be a little bit stiffer, which again is gonna have that same result of making it harder to get blood where you need it. For me, I need it in my brain. <laughs> I feel like the struggle is real. So making sure that your, your blood is flowing freely and can get where it needs to go means staying away from those like fast food lunches. And then again, like I did mention, those refined things, your sodas, your candy, your white flour products, they're just gonna raise you up. And for a second, it's like, wee, you know, you're on the roller coaster, but that crash that follows is just not worth it. Now, caveat, obviously, if you're having a caffeinated soda, that's gonna give you an exaggerated burst of energy. If you do feel like you need a little caffeine, I'm gonna make a plug for better sources. So things like green tea, right? That's a pretty healthy source. It's got some other, you know, phytochemicals in there that can be beneficial. Um, even a small amount of coffee earlier in the day, there's some controversy around coffee, but again, it's, it's actually, I think it's still the top source of antioxidants in the US diet, which actually just doesn't say much for the US diet, but you know, it's got some benefits to it, but not if it's gonna interfere with your sleep later that night. So again, if you're gonna have any caffeinated beverage, have it early and in moderation. And the last thing I'll say about this, and it is amazing to me on a personal level, but the science supports it, is that even mild dehydration can cause issues with mood and concentration. And I think that's what a lot of us are struggling with at like, you know, that two o'clock, three o'clock hour, mood and concentration. And if you're staying optimally hydrated, you are gonna give yourself the best chance of having a much better outlook on life and being able to focus more. So keep that bottle of water or glass of water on your desk, sip it throughout the day. If you're out working or on your feet, just keep a water bottle there and be sipping on it. We have done something like 400 shows between the podcast and this live show here. And that is the first time that I've heard about a link between dehydration and mood. And, really? and that is incredible to me. Yep. That is amazing. Look at you dropping science. And it's bombs real. So I always have my giant, it looks like a coffee mug, but it's actually just water. So it's always here on my desk. I try and keep it full and drink it down. And yeah, it's pretty wild that, that something as simple as just being mildly dehydrated can have an effect on how well you're able to focus in the afternoon. So just keep slugging that water back. Cheers to hydration, my friends. Indeed. Uh, Cecil, by the way, is checking in. Uh, new to the whole vegan diet. She said that she's just soaking in this information. That's so cool. So thanks for being here with us. That's amazing. So if you have a question, by the way, go ahead and post that in the chat, Cecil, and we'll do our best to uh, get you an answer here on the show today. Uh, Follow-up question to what we were talking about as far as foods for energy. Alma is wondering whether or not you recommend drinking green smoothies throughout the day for a little pick-me-up. You know, I don't know that I would sip on it all day long just because you want to give your body a break between when it is digesting and when it is, you know, giving getting a chance to, to process. So you want to give it some time to digest before you hit it again with more calories. So as a general pick me up, though, I am going to very much two thumbs up on the green smoothie, leaning it more towards the vegetables, but putting enough fruit in there to give you a little boost. That's actually... Are you a dietitian, Alma? Because that is actually one of the tricks that I will use um, on days when I'm in the clinic is to have a green smoothie because you can you can down it pretty quickly and it gives you a nice little boost. Although I should say in a perfect world, you would eat it with a spoon to slow your intake so that your blood sugar doesn't go up quite as quickly if you're putting a lot of fruit in there. But yeah, no, that's a great choice. And what is what is your go to smoothie if you're making it yourself in the kitchen? What are you putting in there? Oh man. So I am putting in a, I'm putting in mango. I'm putting in kale or collard greens or spinach. I'm putting in water. I have a true confession. I use the very tiniest amount of the Vega protein and greens protein powder, not for the protein, but the flavor is amazing. I really love it. So I, just put, I don't even put anything near a whole scoop. It's a little tiny, like a like an eighth of a scoop. Honestly, it's like a teaspoon, but I really love the flavor. Um, I'll also dump a little vanilla extract in there ground flax seed. And then um, if I have grapes, those are going in as well. And any random vegetable that's sitting around that seems like it would work like cucumbers or celery, that'll go in there too. So that's sort of my mango, mango and a green frozen. Oh, of course, frozen mango, frozen mango and a green. That's sort of my base. And then I just go to town from there. 
Oh, yeah. You, you just can't go wrong with frozen mango and some sort of a green, right? I mean, it's yeah. just like the healthiest, greatest combo. No, but I got to ask, Chuck, what's your green smoothie of choice? Oh, man. So, all right. So here's what we're doing. We're going kale. We're going heavy on the kale. I mean, we want to fill that blender yes. up. We want this thing thick. We want like green mud just Shove from it. kale, right? <laughs> and then we've got some frozen bananas. We've got some fresh apples. We've got some fresh strawberries. we got Ooh. the fresh mango in there. That's right. And then we blend all that up. Now, if I'm feeling spicy and like I want a little bit of chocolate, I will put a scoop of uh, cacao powder in there and you know, because you just can't go wrong with that nut chocolate combo. Sometimes I'll put just like a half a tablespoon of peanut or almond butter in there just for a little bit of flavor, oh, right? Man. So it's not a whole lot. So you don't have to worry about too much fat or calories if that's a concern of yours. So you put that in there, man, and it is just a flavor explosion and it is heaven in a cup. It is heaven in a cup. so, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Now I think I might have a smoothie for lunch instead of my regularly scheduled lunch. Okay. Whew. I'm telling you, it's right. so good. That it's so, once it hits your lips, it's yeah. so good. So everyone uh, listening out there, take notes on this. <laughs> <laughs> The next I, smoothie awaits. So uh, those smoothies are pretty sweet, but if you notice, neither Lee nor myself had anything in there with added sugar. But we do have a question from somebody right now who is struggling with sugar addiction and wondering what are some great ways that they can go ahead and try to break that sugar addiction. Because I know that this person is not alone. Oh, no. And frankly, I have my own, I have have had and continue to have my own struggles with, oh man, the sweet things, the baked goods, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, particularly because so many of these products, particularly the commercial ones, you know, they're combining sugar, fat and salt and putting it all together in this package that is designed to be irresistible to us. And lo and behold, it sure is. So a couple of thoughts here. First, Taking a week or so to transition if you're not already on sort of a low fat whole food plant based diet can be really useful because it gives you a chance to experiment before you jump in. And then it will often suggest this to try it all in for a few weeks, right? But don't do it alone. If you can possibly find a friend to do it with you, you not only will build the friendship, but you'll also have that support system that you're going to need because it's hard. You're going to be breaking old habits. You're going to be fighting a sugar addiction. Um, these are things that are, are not easily done alone. So find your find your buddy to do that with you. I inevitably, when I see people who are successful, they have found at least one person who is, is there with them alongside them, supporting them along the way. So that's step one. Um, and just sort of a more anecdotal, I've seen people get really good results when they have a fun, concrete goal for themselves, right? So they're breaking their sugar addiction. They're saying, okay, I'm not doing any added sugar for the next three weeks because I'm looking to train for a 5K or some people are doing a half marathon or even if it's just building up to, I want to be able to walk two blocks instead of half a block. Having that concrete goal in mind helps. Um, two more thoughts here. One is catching yourself when you slip no one is perfect, right? And here's the other piece when it comes to eating healthy, I'll eat healthy tomorrow. Have any, I mean, I've, <laughs> how many times have you said this? Um, tomorrow never comes. So the second you catch yourself, right? If you kind of lose it, don't be like, well, the rest of the day is just shot. Nope, you are gonna just climb right back up on the wagon the second you catch yourself and go from there. And then the final piece here, this works beautifully if you, if you, are comfortable using any kind of like app or tool or even just writing things down, record what you eat. Um, generally speaking, unless someone has like a history of an eating disorder, you want to do this. But for others, I've heard this, and I can't remember who said it, but what gets measured gets better. And if you're seeing what you're consuming and you're seeing, oh, here's the calories and the fat and the grams of fiber, the things we're worried about, it can be really motivating to stop when you are to the point where you need it and also to adjust what you're eating to make sure you're getting that fiber, those kinds of things that you need in your diet. So those are my suggestions, but Chuck, I'll turn it to you. Cause I know that food has, you know, that's been a struggle for you too. What are your, what are, what's your advice on this one? Oh man. Uh, uh, <laughs> so when it comes to any kind of craving, right. And, and beating an addiction, it just, to me, one of the things that really has helped me and, and continues to help me to this day is just kind of acknowledging the fact that cravings are not going to be pleasant, okay? But you, for whatever reason, Lee, I find that if you just accept that 
and you just you know that it's the the time is just for lack of a better word it's going to suck for these 10 to 15 minutes however long this craving is going to last but if you accept that it somehow becomes easier to deal with right because you're no longer in this wrestling match you've just kind of like conceded that this isn't going to be a pleasant time but because you recognize that and you're not fighting it it becomes easier to deal with that and before you know it the time passes and over time these cravings become less and less and less of, a, of an issue and less frequent at that as well. So that is something to this day that continues to help me is just riding out the wave and knowing that it's just going to stink for the time being, but soon it shall pass and you will be a okay. So don't fight it. Just go with it. Don't give in. You're going to be just fine. Um, Lee, yes. here's another question. A lot of people now looking for alternatives to sugar. We're having somebody ask specifically, Vicky is, what are your thoughts about monk fruit as a sweetener? So monk fruit, that's a great question, right? So we don't have a lot of data specifically on monk fruit extract. It's very, very sweet, like a couple hundred times sweeter than sugar. So it really does give food that sweet flavor. Um, it is non-nutritive, so it is calorie free. And most of the research shows that these you know, calorie free sweeteners don't have a huge impact on blood sugar or blood sugar control, looking at you know, some meta-analyses. Um, but again, none of this is really looking at monk fruit extract specifically. We do have one study from back in 2017 and they looked at aspartame, monk fruit, stevia, and sugar or sucrose sweetened beverages along with insulin and glucose. And what they found was that of the four drinks, only the sugar sweetened drink caused blood sugar to spike right after drinking it, as you would expect, right? I mean, they're dumping a bunch of sugar in a glass and giving it to you, it's gonna raise your blood sugar. But the calories that people saved, and this has been pretty consistent by having one of these calorie free sweetened drinks, they make those calories up at the next meal. In this case, they gave people an, a lunch an hour later and what calories they didn't get in that sweetened drink but that their body was kind of expecting because they were taking in something sweet, they increased their calorie intake at the next lunch. So the answer is we don't have any reason not to think it's safe at this point. Um, there's I, again, but part of it is just, there's not, there's not a ton of data out there. So my general recommendation on these, even the more natural, you know, natural non-caloric sweeteners is to use them in moderation, if at all. Um, particularly if you're trying to overcome a sugar addiction, having something that triggers those sweet receptors doesn't really let your taste buds change. And that's what you're going for. So I would, I would moderate or not moderate to not at all, if you can help it. That is so true that you make up those calories at the next meal. Yeah. That is, I mean, I used to like tell myself that I would drink this diet lemonade oh, just so yeah. I could have the brownie for dessert. I'm not even <laughs> lying to you. This this is 100% oh, true. That's uh, diet math, isn't it? Oh, it is. <laughs> it's probably it trying is. to not do diets per se. Diet <laughs> math may not always be accurate, man, but it is a serious science nonetheless. Um, <laughs> yes. Good golly, Miss Molly. Uh, yep. All right. So brownies aren't going to help you lose weight, but uh, we have somebody here. Millie is wondering uh, about fiber and weight loss, says that uh, she has read that fiber can help you lose weight. Is that true? And if so, can taking a supplement such as Metamucil help get you going in that direction? Oh, interesting question. So absolutely fiber helps with weight loss, but I think one of the reasons, and I confess, I don't know specifically, I've not looked at the data on Metamucil and weight loss, <laughs> so, which I think Metamucil, if I recall correctly, is psyllium fiber. And I don't know of any data on that either, but I also, I have not looked recently. Um, we know that fiber helps people to feel fuller longer. I suspect it is going to be the fiber that you find in a whole food. And the reason that is, is these high fiber whole plant foods tend to be lower in calorie density. What that means is you're getting more volume of food for fewer calories, which is a great way to lose weight or stay at your healthy weight. So I think that's probably the driving force behind the fiber connection with weight loss. And But that's a real force because your stomach does have stretch receptors, right? And fiber helps trigger those stretch receptors to let your brain know that it's actually had enough food and that's one of the things when you're eating something like a donut or a burger, there's no fiber. It takes up very little space in the stomach. So you can just keep eating and eating and your brain is like, well, we're not full yet. So we're just going to keep on bringing in more calories, way more calories than the body can actually use. So I don't, I expect that if a fiber supplement was an easy way to lose weight, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. That's just my thought. I don't mm. know for sure. Um, but if Metamucil led to reliable weight loss, 
Metamucil will be rich and <laughs> I would have to find a new job and that would be okay. I would be fine with that. But uh, so I suspect not, but I can't say for sure on this fiber supplements, but I sure can say on those high fiber whole plant foods that absolutely they are linked to being at a healthy weight. All right, let's take a question here from Cloverly, wrote in at 1221. Cloverly says, I've been plant-based for two weeks, but have not seen a lot of weight loss. What can I do? Oh, good question. All right, Cloverly, thank you for asking that. So a couple of things to look at. One is to look at what kind of plant foods are you eating? So are they really and truly whole food? <laughs> That's step one, right? So make sure it's not like some naturally thing sneaking in because a lot of these more whole food processed products are still going to be adding a ton of oil and it's kind of sneaky sometimes. So look for that. If you've already looked for that, then you're going to look at, okay, well, I'm on a whole food plant-based diet, so I'm not adding oils, but am I eating foods that are naturally really high in fat? And why that matters is because fat is more than twice as calorie dense than either carbohydrate or protein. So the same amount of fat, you're getting twice the calories you'd get in that volume of protein or carbohydrate. So you're going to look for things like nuts and seeds, even if it's in something like a salad dressing, you're going to look for avocado. And if you're leaning really heavily on those foods, or you're having them, you know, with every time you eat, you're going to want to dial back on that if you're trying to lose weight, just because it's so easy to bring in a whole lot of calories. Um, you can slow yourself down with the nuts and seeds by having to crack them open yourself. <laughs> if you want to try <laughs> that adds an, a little sport and gives your brain again, some time to catch up to oh, wow, wait, we've had enough calories. Um, so those would be the two, I would look for sneaky, not whole food things. And I would look for the amount of um, fat in the diet. And then the last piece is just, are you eating more than you need? Because sometimes if you're eating out of stress or boredom, you might just be eating more than you need. And while it's harder to do that on a whole food plant-based diet, it, it can happen. Like you can eat, you can eat more than is judicious just because you're eating for boredom or stress, which I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm also guilty of this. So I understand um, those are the things that I would look for. All right. Uh, let's uh, flash forward. Say somebody has been losing weight, but then they hit that plateau. So we have a couple of viewers right now who have actually hit that plateau. Uh, one at 1217 who's watching us on Facebook. We have another one in the mailbag from a viewer on Instagram uh, who took it a step further and wants to know that now that they've hit this weight loss plateau, should they start <laughs> to limit their carb intake? I would say no. Um, assuming you're already on the sort of lower fat, whole food, plant-based diet. So first off, plateaus are expected. I don't know that we necessarily know what causes them, but I've seen them in the clinic where people are losing weight and they're doing great. And then their weight loss just levels out. And sometimes it can be for weeks and I don't understand it. They don't understand it. Nobody really gets it, but it happens. So part of it, I might just say, stay the course. If you've been steadily losing weight and you've just flattened out, I would give it a few weeks don't change. You don't, I wouldn't change anything and just see if it then resumes. If it doesn't resume, I wouldn't, carbohydrate is not like a food. <laughs> so it's tricky to be like, I'm going to reduce carbs. Like, are we talking like donuts and bagels carbs? Or are we talking like beans and oats and fruit carbs? So I would say if you get to that point where you've leveled out, you've given it a few weeks and you're still not seeing any weight loss, that's when I would go through and really I would amp up the fruits and vegetables and maybe bring down some of the whole grains. I, it breaks my heart. And I can't even say that for beans because they're so linked to healthy weight. Um, maybe, but quite honestly, this might just be part of the natural progression of weight loss where you just hang out for a little bit and then your weight will decrease. Um, but no, I would not cut carbohydrates. I would go through and look first for any added oils or things that are sneaking in there before I went after those complex carbohydrate rich foods. All right, let's go ahead and uh, bounce back over to sweeteners. Uh, we have a follow up question here from Sally wants to know, do sweeteners affect the kidney? What do you know about that? Oh, you know, I don't know anything specific about sweeteners affecting the kidney. Obviously, if you have high blood sugar, if you have prediabetes or diabetes, that is not great for the kidney. What I do know is really bad for the kidney that is linked oftentimes with these artificial sweeteners are diet colas, any colas, because they contain something called phosphoric acid. And any of these phosphoric or phosphate additives are really, really tough on your kidney. They're hard for your kidney to get rid of. So 
any soda, any, I mean, just don't drink soda <laughs> in a perfect world. Just don't, um, or in very tiny amounts. Um, but anything that has like the phosphoric acid in it. So any of your cola beverages, many of which are artificially sweetened, um, those are going to be really hard on kidney health. There may be some other data on the artificial sweeteners with kidney health <clears throat> or the other non caloric sweeteners. I'm just not aware of it, but I do know there is that issue very much with diet and regular cola types of sodas. You know, the sweeteners are an interesting thing. I remember as a kid being terrified of the the pink packets. I think that was sweet and low because they yeah. they came with that warning, like may cause cancer. And <laughs> I always wondered like, well, why in the world are you selling this if it may cause cancer? Like it never really made sense to me um, that they would be like, hey, you know, have this. It can cause cancer, by the way, so can cigarettes, you know, cigarettes aren't healthy, but this is just fine. What, you know, what is that? Yeah, is that? no, I tend to, particularly the artificial, I, I stay way away from the artificial sweet, artificial calorie-free sweeteners. I, when I use calorie-free sweeteners, I tend to go towards the sort of stevia route, but even those have some issues now. There's some question with stevia and, you know, gut health. So it just, it's probably better to not cross the right. board. All yeah. right, Fiber Queen, question from Mark here. Wants to know, is there a limit to the benefits you get from whole plants and fiber? Is more always better or are there adverse effects for having too much? Too much fiber. I um, know. I think the too much fiber would come in in the form of a supplement, right? So if you're eating the actual whole plant foods to the amount that your body needs until you're full, I don't know of any adverse effects of fiber. I do know of lots of beneficial effects, not just in terms of triggering your brain to know, hey, I'm full, but in terms of helping grow the kind of gut flora that's going to give you vibrant good health and longevity. Um, I will say this, if you're not accustomed to eating high fiber foods, there are going to be some gastrointestinal consequences from <laughs> drastically increasing your fiber intake rapidly. So you're gonna wanna do that slowly and gently because there is there is that sort of gradient of okay i'm going from the standard american diet and i'm transitioning onto this whole food plant-based diet there are going to be negative consequences if you ramp up your fiber in a couple days you, you there will be bloating it will be uncomfortable so please don't do that do it gently no um kidding. yeah so other than that no yes fiber can interfere with the absorption of some nutrients but you're getting so many nutrients on a whole food plant-based diet that it not only counteracts but exceeds any of the effects of fiber so no i really stay away from the supplements just eat your fiber in the whole foods the way it was put there now you mentioned whole foods there a couple of times we have a great question from pinar who's wondering how would you define whole foods what are they exactly oh that's actually a really good question and surprisingly like hotly debated in the nutrition community like what qualifies as whole um Whole to me is looks like something that could have grown outside <laughs> in a perfect world. Then there becomes, so that's a really simple kind of blase definition. Then it gets a little more, well, what if you take the whole grain that looks like something that could grow on a, you know, a stalk and then you grind it up. Is that whole? Um, my answer there is it's better if you eat it like a, for grains, if you eat it whole and intact. Yes, that is preferred. Does that mean you're never going to eat a piece of whole grain bread? No. So, if you're gonna do a bread, I would like to see the entire thing, like the entire grain of wheat get pulverized as opposed to having the bran and the, you know, all the fiber and everything stripped away and just having a little empty starch that's sort of in the very center of the grain. So that would be, again, for me, the closer it looks to the way it was grown. And then the, again, the processing definition is what's processed? Well. I think that's something you can do in your kitchen to me, and this is just totally anecdotal, my own definition. If I can do it in my kitchen, that's pretty minimally processed, right? I'm not going to use weird chemicals or food additives to like remove, you know, fraction out parts of my food. That's not something I typically, I take the skin off of onions. That's about as far as that goes. Um, so if you can do it in your kitchen, that's my loose definition of that's still a whole food. That's right. whole food. You don't clean your cucumbers with <laughs> Clorox. Is that what you're saying? I don't like dip them in lye and strip stuff off. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Ugh, that sounds awful. Don't do that. 
Oh, all right. Uh, man, I, I love these mailbag segments because you do bounce around and you get a little bit of everything. Here's a question <laughs> from um, Tracy. Uh, this is a really interesting one. From what I can see, there are no plant sources of collagen and it is strictly an animal product. But I've seen lots of media hype about bone broth, but I don't believe much of it. If we are wanting to stick to our plant-based diet, what are some collagen building foods that we can add for our skin? Okay, Tracy, you're absolutely right. It's a whole mess of hype and not really any data to support it. Again, everyone's like, oh, collagen, like, where's it coming? It's coming from cows. Where did the cows get it? They got it from plants. Hey, and that's where you're going to get it too. So collagen, just a quick overview. That's the sort of main structural protein that's found in like connective tissue and in the skin. Um, and again, the hype surrounding bone broth kind of, it entertains me just a little bit um, because Collagen is made up of the building blocks of protein, which are, Chuck? Fiber? What, what, no. I'm, I'm looking <laughs> ahead, man. Don't catch me off guard. <laughs> I love it. Amino acids. Sorry, that was a very evil sounding uh, laugh. I know. Um, I'm like, <laughs> like, like a 301. I just asked the questions, okay? <gasps> oh, you're no fun. Fine. Uh, no, uh, no. over. No. <laughs> amino acids. So collagen is made up of these building blocks called amino acids. There's no magic there. Um, and just like other proteins, when you digest them, you digest them. So you break them down into little, to the little building blocks, those little amino acids, and you absorb those. And then you make those into whatever it is that your body needs, including things like collagen. It's not like your body's going to absorb that whole collagen protein from the collagen and just like stick it right into your skin and your face. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. So as long as you're eating a variety of plant foods, that's including legumes. And I have to make a plug for legumes on a plant-based diet. You got to be eating some legumes to be eating a complete diet. So those are beans, split peas, lentils, tofu, that kind of thing. Um, you're eating that variety of amino acid or protein containing foods, which you're getting because protein is in pretty much everything. You're going to be getting what you need. Now, what other things do you need to make collagen besides protein? And this is the important part because again, having the collagen, your body's just going to break it down and you'll have some of the building blocks, but you don't have the other things you need to make it. Um, vitamin C, critical to building collagen in the body, right? So you, people probably know this, but you know, fresh fruits and some of the vegetables, some standouts are strawberries, oranges, kiwis, those colorful bell peppers, right? Like the yellow, orange, red ones, the sort of like fiesta color ones. Those are fantastic in terms of providing the vitamin C your body needs to make collagen. Your body also needs iron, not too much, but just enough iron to make collagen. So that's a nice plug for more beans and greens. So if I had to pick like a meal that was like the ultimate skin building meal, I would be saying beans on a whole grain, right? Like brown rice or quinoa. So you're getting that full, just not that you need to combine your proteins at once, but you just, again, this is just the optimal all at once. Beans on a whole grain, so like a beans and rice with chopped red and orange bell peppers and then strawberries or oranges for dessert because you're getting your protein, you're getting your iron, you're getting your vitamin C, and you're going to have what you need to make your skin glowy, dewy, and wonderful. I will also point out that because you're not taking in some of the scary things that are found in bone broth, and what by that I mean are the heavy metals that accumulate in bones that can then leach into the broth, so things like lead and cadmium, you're going to be better off for it. So you are absolutely correct to stay away from the bone broth and to eat those other collagen building plant foods. Yeah, let me redeem myself here uh, because I failed that <laughs> quiz miserably. A oh, ago. You, you mentioned iron and vitamin C and they do yes. go together like peas and carrots. So if you're, you're trying to absorb that iron, you're gonna want a little bit of vitamin C with that to uh, make sure that you do absorb it to the best of your body's ability. Thank you for the plug. That is very important information. Thank you. See, redemption. Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, question, we, we have time for a couple of more. Uh, <laughs> quiz, uh, question from Yolanda here at 1230. Back to sweeteners. What about dates or maple syrup as a sweetener? Would that Ooh. be a healthy option? Good question. Um, I prefer dates to maple syrup. I mean, for taste, I like them both. <laughs> but in terms of the health content, I like dates because they are coming with all the fiber, right? And so you're having maple syrup. That's it's still a natural product, agreed, but it's a it's a you know sap out of a tree. They concentrate it down, so it's basically just a concentrated form of sugar that doesn't have any fiber to slow its absorption. I know you're going to put it on things, so I get that. And a little bit of maple syrup is fine. But it, hey, if you're asking which is better, which is like in a more perfect world, which would I do? I'd have a date. So if I'm going to sweeten up a smoothie because I don't know, maybe the mango wasn't good that day or whatever, I would 
take the pit out. Has anyone tried the, <laughs> has anyone accidentally put the date in the blender with the pit in it? It's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would use, I would, yes, I would go for the date every time. And they actually make date sugar. That's kind of hard to find, but if you can, it's great. Cause it's literally just dehydrated ground up dates, but it works like sugar for the most part. I don't know about baking applications necessarily, but yeah, it's a, it's a great choice. You bet. All right. Uh, next to last question comes to us from Betsy. Uh, what are the best foods for osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis. That's a tricky one because there's no perfect, you know, we don't really know what to do, but what I can tell you is going for that whole food plant-based diet, again, is going to be useful and gently moving the joints because what's bringing, joints don't actually have great blood flow. So what's going to bring in better blood flow and help those tissues remove waste and bring them oxygen and nutrients is going to be gentle movement as, as approved by your healthcare provider. Um, but in addition to that, you're going to want to be eating things that are rich in antioxidants, things that are going to help your cardiovascular health. Again, why? Because joints are very sensitive because their blood flow is not great. They're sensitive to limits in blood flow. And what's going to limit that? Well, atherosclerotic plaques and arteries and veins that are that have stiffer, stiffer walls and that don't give and bring blood to that area. So that heart healthy, whole food plant-based diet is gonna be great for joints. Um, and then again, anything that's sort of anti-inflammatory, we're gonna come back here, especially to dark leafy greens. Those are gonna be beneficial. Um, I'm all about people adding turmeric to their foods. Um, some of the high dose supplements I get a little iffy about because they can interfere with iron absorption, but um, adding some of those anti-inflammatory spices like turmeric with a little black pepper to enhance absorption of the curcumin that's in there. Um, I think those are a great addition. So yeah, things like ginger, garlic also right up there. I want to rile up the people watching right now. Is oh dear. Turmeric or is it turmeric? Hmm? All right. Weigh in on that debate, man. I've seen some like hot, hot I did comments not know that. that was a thing. Oh, it's a big thing. People take that very, very seriously. Turmeric or turmeric? I don't know. Choose your words wisely. Apparently I'm on team turmeric, but I might be wrong. <laughs> oh, you're a turmeric person. I mean, phonetically, yeah. I, I think that you're absolutely right, but there is a great majority of people who say turmeric. So and I don't, I don't know. English is not a phonetic language. So, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> no, no, no. We kind of make it our own. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Final question actually comes to us from the person who has the screen name of the day. Carved up Kayla. Is oh my gosh, that's I the know. best screen name How, I've heard. <laughs> so alliterative, so perfect. Carved, Carved up Kayla. Up Kayla. Love it, yes. Love it, right? Okay. She actually is wondering what's the best route to become a dietitian. Oh, well, I'm so glad you asked. If you are in school, if you're looking to go to college, you're going to look for a school that has a didactic program in dietetics. Not all schools have these. I went undergrad to the University of Virginia, and I didn't even know dietetics was a career field because that was not at my school. So you would go to eatright.org, and you would look up the schools that offer, um, have a didactic, which is fancy for teaching, a didactic program in dietetics, um, and go to one of those, um, preferably for an undergrad. If you are a career changer, as I was, you are going to need to complete a didactic program in dietetics and very soon also a master's degree. So again, you're going to go to eatright.org and look for programs that offer you the coursework you need to be a dietitian. And then you are either going to, as part of your master's program, do an internship, which is, I forget, 900 or 1,000 hours of supervised practice in hospital settings and food service and outpatient in the community. Um, and what did I miss here? Um, I think I covered all the bases. Oh, and you'll meet with whichever, if you are coming in as a career changer, you may have already covered some of the um, <clears throat> prerequisite courses that you would need to become a dietitian. So, you know, if you did some science back in school or some math courses or stats or any of those kinds of things, some of that's going to count in your favor. So you may not have as much room to travel as or as long as far to travel as you think you do. So it's an awesome profession. I think it's a great profession. Also, at any age, there are lots of you don't have to be 20, 22 to go be a dietitian. There are plenty of people in their 40s and 50s and beyond who do this. So let me encourage you. We need more people who have plant based nutrition knowledge to join the field and uh, yeah, keep this whole plant based revolution going.
I love it. And it's, it's going strong. I mean, it's, it's gaining steam. I mean, as more and more science comes out there, more and more people are kind of seeing the light here, which I think is really cool. The fact that it's not just Joe's blog telling you to do this. <laughs> I mean, we, we have like serious Joe. scientific data that backs up everything that it is that we talk about here uh, at the physicians committee and certainly here on the exam room. Um, so that is very cool. Yes. Go become a dietitian. The world needs more people just like that. Uh, and as to the turmeric, turmeric, debate. Um, here we go. JL uh, says that she's having a debate with uh, their sister about this. Okay. Yes. So it's the sibling rivalry, turmeric Ooh. versus turmeric. And then uh, here, here you go. Comment of the day, Tofu Tuesday, turmeric, <laughs> turmeric. There's an Thank R you. in there. And while we're at it, turmeric, so wait, team turmeric for but, the but, win. But, 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 but wait for it. Wait uh -oh. for it now. So no. she, she says, while we're at it, it's uh -oh. instant pot, not Instapot. Thank you. Instant Thank pot, you. Not Instapot. It's instant pot. And there's a T <laughs> on there. I, what's it? Tofu Tuesday? Is that, is tofu that right? Tofu Tuesday. Yes. All right. Tofu Tuesday. Yes. Representing. Yes. I know, man. I, I love the Ruby so much. You guys just uh, bring me. Tofu just Tuesday so uses the Oxford comma too. Don't I support. Oh yeah. I know. Carved up Kayla Tofu Tuesday. It's an alliterative. Oh, Kayla. Part. Okay. I heard Kayla. Yeah. Carved up Kayla. These are some awesome screen names. Thank you guys for being I so know. creative. They're, They're awesome. Amazing. They're awesome. By the way, uh, your screen name, Lee at Veggie Quest uh, on IG and yes. on Twitter, Veggie underscore Quest. So go give those accounts a couple of follows. And by the way, if you would like to make an appointment to visit with Lee at the Barnard Medical Center, my goodness gracious, Lee, you're doing telehealth visits. So people we don't even are. need to leave their home. Yes, not every state, but an awful lot of states, Virginia, Maryland, DC, let's see, California, Kentucky, Florida. I think I'm missing one, Arizona. There's another, it's quite a few states. Yeah, we I can know. advance because the calendar books up. So hey, <laughs> it does. So uh, here's the deal: for a full list of states where services are available with Lee and the other dietitians and doctors at the Barnard Medical Center, and to make an appointment, all you need to do is head over to BarnardMedical.org or pick up the phone old school 202-527-7500 to make that appointment. Uh, and yeah, I think it's fantastic. I know that there are a number of listeners and viewers of the exam room, Lee, who have made appointments with you and they have not been disappointed whatsoever. I hope not. I try my best. I would love to talk to anyone. And again, we have an awesome team at Barnard Medical. So absolutely, if you are on the fence, should I, shouldn't I make an appointment? Do it. <laughs> I'm biased, but I can unbiasedly say, yeah, the team is absolutely fantastic. They are just so enthusiastic about their jobs and their mission and improving your health. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You guys are super enthusiastic and just want to help. And that makes you just so much better than so many people out there uh, that are providing help. So thank you for caring, Lee. Well, thank you for having me on the podcast, Chuck. This was a fun a fun, uh, little exciting. <laughs> we kind of covered all the bases. I think we've, we've covered all the topics I can think of. I know. Well, I mean, that's the cool thing. Like I said, that the mailbag segments are the absolute best. So we'll do this Class. again sometime soon. Absolutely. All right. All the right. Dietitian's mailbag is now closed. And by the way, if you would like to relive the fun, uh, we will be releasing the full audio of today's show on tomorrow's podcast. So go ahead. If you haven't already subscribed to it, head over to Apple podcast or Spotify, wherever you get your shows, go ahead, subscribe to the exam room by the physicians committee. And when you're there, Big, big, big ask here. Please also leave a five star rating and a nice review because every single new subscription and five star review helps to get the show a little bit higher in the podcast rankings. And we're not just doing that to you know, beat our chest here. We ask that you do that so that the people who need this information the most can actually find it. So the higher we are in the rankings, the easier it becomes for people to find this potentially life-saving information. So if you could take a couple of seconds, head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee and leave that five-star rating, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. But for now, that, my friend, is all the time that I have. I want to say thank you one more time to the great Lee Crosby, the fiber queen. Thank you so much for being here, Lee. And to the crew behind the scenes that's making the magic happen. Thank you, guys. And to you, my exam roomies, thank you for keeping us entertained today. You are the absolute best. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based.